Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, the Thunder Imager EM CryoClem, How to Identify and Retrieve Your Cellular Targets for Cryo-Electron Microscopy. I am Christy Jewell of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by LabRoots and sponsored by Leica Microsystems. For more information on our sponsor, please visit leica-microsystems.com. Now let's get started. I would like to remind everyone that today's event is interactive, and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We will answer as many of your questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window, or you can report your problem by using that Ask a Question box located on the left side of your screen. Today's presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I would now like to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Jan de Bock, Application Manager, Correlative Microscopy at Leica Microsystems. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. DeBach, welcome. You may now begin your presentation. Thank you, Christy, for this very kind introduction. And um, I welcome you to this webinar about how we from Leica can contribute to, to get a better understanding of cellular mechanisms or cellular biology in, in general. And specifically, I would like to explain the role of our cryo-white field microscope, the Thunder Imager EM CryoClan. And the first question which might appear in your mind is why cryo, why cryogenic conditions and workflows under deep temperature are important anyway? And the answer actually is this image here. You can see an image provided kindly by Benjamin Engel from the Max Planck Institute in Martinsried, Germany. And it shows a 3D view of uh, the interior of a cell. Um, the nuclear membrane in gray with nuclear pore complexes in purple. And uh, for example, the mit mitochondrion in orange. <clears throat> and different types of proteasomes tethering to different sides of the nuclear pore. And now, why is such an image so impressive? Uh, you've probably seen hundreds of textbook schemes in your life. The difference is it's not a textbook scheme. It's a real rendered image of a, of a real cell, of an individual cell examined in unprecedented resolution. And this answers the initial question why cryo workflows are so important because with this technique, one can resolve the interior of cells and reveal the sociology of proteins and other biomolecules with sub-nanometer resolution. It's really incredible, and it was also called a resolution revolution. It also shows the interaction of these proteins and the complete structural context in the 3D volume examined. Now, which techniques are needed to reveal such a cellular context? The following main steps are needed. Um, the cells of interest are grown um, or attached to an EM grid and vitrified. Vitrification is very fast freezing without the formation of destructive ice crystals. And of course, after vitrification, all steps have to be under cryogenic conditions. And <clears throat> like this, like this, uh, um, with this vitrification, the proteins are fixated, but they stay in an almost native state. And then structures of interest can be selected, and the selected areas can be milled down um, by a specific scanning electron microscope. And this scanning electron microscope is shown here in this milling step. It's a focused ion beam scanning electron microscope, or in short, FIP-SEM. 
And the thin ice sheet, which is remaining, is a so-called lamella. You will probably see that later in an image. This thin ice sheet, this lamella, is then transferred to a cryo-TEM, transmission electron microscope, and tilted while observation to obtain the 3D tomogram, like shown before. So the last step is the 3D cryo tomography. And if this little arrow on the right hand symbol, you can see that um, the lamella is tilted. Now, what has this to do with light microscopy and how can a light microscopy techniques by Leica contribute to achieve a 3D tomogram? And the question is, and the answer is such workflows um, have many steps. And in particular, running an electron microscope is very expensive and one must validate the sample early in the process. And um, <clears throat> this is to avoid unnecessary steps by using a faulty specimen. So they are terribly expensive. And um, secondly, one needs to identify and retrieve target structures which might be invisible in the, in the SEM. And for this purposes, a light microscope or in particular a fluorescence microscope is essential. And it must be a cryogenic system keeping the sample vitrified at all times during transfer and imaging of the sample. And I'm really proud to introduce to you the Thunder Imager EM CryoClam, which serves exactly these needs. The Thunder Imager CryoClam is a fully motorized upright camera-based microscope. And it belongs to a whole family of imaging systems providing the new Leica Thunder technology. About Thunder, I will talk later. But, and yeah, of course, um, the system is not completely new. The base of the system is um, was released 2017 and it's already the third generation of such a system and the customer base is now more than 40 systems globally. Now coming back to the quality assessment of the sample. Here you can see human fibroblast vitrified on an EM grid and under transmitted light conditions, one can identify defects in the carbon film of the grid. Here you can see such holes in the film. And one can see crystalline eyes, these more dark patches in the image, which would disturb the milling process and also the observation by the TEM. And of course, one can also identify suitable areas for EM observation. And secondly, one can also find the presence and distribution of the target fluorescence. Here of these um, beta-1 integrins can be visualized in the yellow squares. Now, as one would like to exactly retrieve these fluorescent targets in the SEM, it's very helpful to transfer these coordinates together with the image data towards the SEM or to the TEM. And this is exactly what our Thunder CryoClam is allowing. You can transfer the image data and the coordinates together to, for example, serial EM, which would run mostly on TEMs, and for example, also to Thermo Fisher maps software. <clears throat> and then you just open one, one file with the image and the coordinates. Speaking of Image data, unfortunately, in a wide field microscope, um, blur can always be a problem, especially when imaging thicker samples with, for example, se several cell layers. And the reason is that light from different optical planes reaches focal plane and is blurring the image. To reveal the hidden information, Leica has developed the Thunder technology, and Thunder is an optodigital method that removes this out-of-focus blur. As you know, all 
optical parameters of our microscopes, we can uh, very exactly determine where the light originally was derived from, and we can provide also different methods for specific sample thickness. And here you see the result on the left hand side, the unprocessed image on the right hand side, the so called standard image. Now, Using Thunder, one can identify target structures more precisely compared to standard images. That's why it's so important also for targeting. And the idea is that the target structures later are maintained in the lamella. So far, we can provide the XY uh, coordinates, and um, one can retrieve the XY coordinate in the SEM. Here you see this specific focused ion beam SEM in a schematic drawing. The um, electron beam is coming from top for the observation and the focused ion beam removing um, the upper and lower part of the um, above and below the lamella um, is coming here from this angle. Now, here on the left-hand side, you can see a pile of uh, yeast cells, and um, exactly this pile of yeast cell, uh, cells was transferred for, to the milling step. On the right-hand side, you see the same target cell um, after the first milling steps here. And the um, red fluorescence here are nucleoli, and the green fluorescence is the outer fluorescence of the cell wall. And exactly this position here was retrieved in the FIT SEM. The next images show the same lamella, and uh, you see here the lamella in the context of the EM grid. The detail here in the center image um, uh, are already in the transmitted electron microscope, and on the right hand side, an overlay of the TEM image and the fluorescence. The resulting tomogram at the end would look somehow like this. This is one image of the tilt series of um, a tomogram. And um, you can see it's a black and white image, fully packed with data actually, which has to be uh, reconstructed by sophisticated um, software algorithms. But this is exactly one image out of such a tomogram um, of the yeast cell. Now, finally, a tomogram would be reconstructed in that way, like this first image I showed to you of the, of the cell and the nuclear pores. Uh, it's not the same tomogram of the yeast cell, but such a tomogram um, could be reconstructed um, out of the raw data. Now, what are the essential components of the Thunder Imager cryoplan? It's an upright camera-based system, as I said, and one of the crucial components is the highly sensitive fluorescence camera on top of the system. We have a cryo stage maintaining the sample in a proper way. I will show an image in a second. And one of the most essential parts is, of course, the objective. It's a dedicated cryo objective with the highest numerical aperture on the market and actually the only commercially available cryo objective. The numerical aperture determines final resolution. That's why that is so important. And 0 0.9 is quite a high number for an objective without any immersion. Of course, we have to maintain the sample safe under vitrified cryo conditions. And this is done by this patented cryo stage here with lid. On the left-hand side, you see the lid um, of the stage. And the sample is kept under gaseous nitrogen and constant overpressure to avoid any contamination by air moisture. The sample is loaded and transferred intuitively by our transfer shuttle, which you can see here. And the grids are hosted in so-called cartridges. 
here you can see such a cartridge for bare grids and it can provide cartridges for bare or unclipped grids and for clipped grids, so-called outer grids. Now, how does the light microscope integrate into the workflow and what workflows can we provide? And the first basic workflow actually um, where we started with was the so-called cryoclim workflow. On the left-hand side, you see the sample and with this red circle, the target area is marked in a, a symbolic way. And the sample can be nicely plunge frozen with our fully automated red plunger, the second generation already, it's called EMGP2. And then of course, we can identify and image the sample um, with thunder image or EM cryoclin. And then finally, we can directly transfer the sample to the cryo TEM and the coordinates can be transferred via the software. And we have several interfaces. One I would really like to mention is the interface to serial EM. So we can provide the coordinates you mark on the light microscope directly to serial EM and visualize it in serial EM. And secondly, also for Thermo Fisher scientific maps. But we were talking about cryotomography and here I would like to show two workflows. First is the so-called flexible tomography workflow. And they are flexible because at the end you can use different types of cryofipsums and um, the start is the same. The EM grid here with a frozen sample, um, sorry, with the sample it will be vitrified with the EMGP2. You can identify and select and mark the target positions with the Thunder Imager EM cryoclam. And then you can transfer the sample with the so-called VCT, but your own cryo transfer system, VCT 500, and <clears throat> use the vacuum cryo manipulation stage you see here, the EMVCM. And then a uh, coding can be applied, a platinum protection layer uh, pro can be added prior to the FIP milling process by the EMA 600 or 900. And then we can proceed to the cryo FIP. And as I said, this can be, for example, a GEOL, PESCAN, or a site. Leica and Thermo Fisher can provide another workflow. It's a so-called integrated workflow. Depending on the FIPSEM used, in this case here, it's the FIPSEM by Thermo Fisher, the Thermo Fisher Scientific Aquilos. And what is so special about this workflow? First of all, there is again the transfer of the XY coordinates from the cryolite microscope to the Aquilos. And this is nicely done with a one-click import of an image file containing the image data and the coordinates. Here you see two little screenshots on the right-hand side of the software where we directly load the image and coordinate file with one click. And the second advantage is the hardware integration um, of our cartridge. And the grid cartridge can be hosted by the FIP shuttle directly. It, the grids do not have to be unloaded for the milling step. And um, this helps by reducing unnecessary transfer steps. Here you can see the FIP shuttle on the left-hand side. And um, in the center, you see the cartridge which is, which is already clipped into the FIP shuttle. And the more unnecessary steps you reduce, the, the more reliable the workflow is. Now coming to the benefits. First of all, you can specify the sample by um, quality assessment and fluorescence, the distribution. You can easily retrieve the target regions by having the interface between the software and um, the sample transfer is safer because you have less steps. You don't need to unclip 
the autocrats. So you can provide hopefully a more reliable workflow and the target will be such a nice rendered tomogram. Coming back to the standard technology. I said that I would talk about this later and I would like to show you this image here again. Here is the yeast example I showed to you and the nucleoli here are now much easier to identify because the haze is removed. Another example is shown here. These are HeLa cells kindly provided by Lucy Collinson's lab. And you can see fibrous actin labeled in red and the Trans-Golgi network probably in the background here in this um, yellowish color and nuclei, nuclei in blue. And the thunder results are clearly visible when I click the next slide and you can see how the actin fibers appear and the trans network is really nicely to discriminate from the background. Now, what is the thunder technology? <clears throat> thunder is like a proprietary development and it's an optodigital method called computational clearing. And as you can see, it applies to 2D images, but also, of course, to 3D images. And the core technology is this computational clearing. You can provide different methods for different sample types. And Thunder automatically takes all relevant optical parameters into account. On top to the core technology, which I said is this instant computational clearing, um, we also apply a so-called decision mask technology. And this is called whether small volume computational clearing or large volume computational clearing, depending on the sample thickness. And the decision mask detects the local signal over the image and preserves it. That's very important to know because then you can actually run a fully automated deconvolution independent actually of your manual user input. That's very nice. Already with the first click, you obtain very nice results and as said, you can sp provide specific methods for more thicker or thinner samples. Okay, of course, um, the Thunder Imager Cryoclam is part of a whole family of Thunder Images. And we, con we can provide powerful system solutions for any of your core life science applications you might have. For example, here on the left-hand upper panel, you can see the Thunder Image room for model organisms. Um, you can see a dedicated system for tissue slices, but also 3D tissue, 3D cell culture, for example, spheroids, and of course, also for more assay-based um, applications. And the Thunder Image or Cryoclam serves to your needs in the cryo or more in the EM-related field. Further information on Thunder, you can have through these links here, we have a nice technology note that you can get more deep insight into the technology. We provide a very nice image gallery with many examples how Thunder improves your image quality. Here are some recent citations using the predecessor of the Thunder Imager, um, the so-called EM Cryoclam, kindly provided by the EMBL, by Rainer Kaufmann's group, and also uh, by Liz Wright's lab. If you want to see the system live, for the USI, we can provide two reference centers. One is at UCSD, University of California, San Diego, in Elizabeth Villas group. And the other one is at Yale University, the West Campus, Junyu. In all other customers in other regions across the globe, are kindly invited to Germany, whether to the Max Planck Institute in Martin Street, the Baumeister Lab in Jürgen Plitzko's group, or the European Molecular Biology Lab, the EMBL in Heidelberg, in the EM facility, 
with Yannick Schwab. And with this, I would like to finish my presentation and thank you very much for your attention and I'm open now for questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. DeBach, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of our webinar. Now to our audience, if you have a question you would like to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we will answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Okay, let's get started. We have so many great questions already coming in. Dr. DeBach, let's start with this one. Can you do targeting in X, Y, and Z? Thank you, Christy. That's an excellent question. Um, I also saw it uh, quite often in the list. Um, right now, we can provide XYZ um, image stacks <clears throat> and um, uh, the coordinates only in XY. So we are working on getting this done, but right now we are um, providing the coordinates in XY. But of course, we can provide a complete 3D Z stack um, of the light microscope. And um, in some softwares already, you can load the, the 3D stack and you can get a, a glimpse on the um, 3D distribution of the fluorescent target. And um, for example, in thermal feature maps, you can slide through the fluorescent slides and get a better impression um, where to target the, the lamella. Thank you. Dr. DeBach. Can I export the coordinates to other FIB SEM than the Thermo Aquilos? Um, yes, you can do that. Um, we provide an XML um, file with the coordinates. And um, as long as the um, manufacturer of the EM can read this XML file, um, they can get the coordinates um, according to the center of the image. Um, that's I think already possible for TESCAN, for example, they just um, uh, looked at the XML file and imported the coordinates. Can I also combine this workflow with a VCT500 from Leica? And yes, I think I showed uh, one of the images in the flexible workflow. Give me one second. Um, I hope that you can see that on the screen now. You see in the center, um, uh, a device with a, a rod sticking out to the left-hand side. Uh, this is the VCM system, <clears throat> and the rod is actually attached to the VCT. VCT means vacuum cryo transfer system, which um, has a little viewer inside and can nicely um, transfer the sample under cryogenic con conditions. And um, as soon as you stick it here to this uh, vacuum cryo manipulation station, the VCM, you can also see the temperature and the um, state of the vacuum, so you are always sure um, how the state of your sample is during uh, transfer. Thank you, Dr. DeBach. What does the thunder processing actually do? What does it do exactly? Thank you for this question. Um, it also came into my mind when I first um, uh, saw the first slides um, when Thunder was released. And um, it's, it's a long story, but I, I will keep it short. And so uh, the, the heart is the computational clearing here. And in, uh, it detects and removes the out of focus background uh, light for each image. And this makes the, the signal of interest directly accessible. At the same time, um, in the in-focus area, the, the edges of the signal and the intensity of the specimen features uh, remain intact. That's important because you uh, just not do a background subtraction where you lose all the signal, but you really keep the features of your sample um, uh, intact. That's why you also can um, uh, select a feature size and expected feature size. And um, uh, secondly, one question was there, uh, how the resolution of thunder can, uh, how does thunder improve the resolution? And it does, it uh, shows the resol resolution enhancement in um, XY, so laterally, laterally 
two times and actually um, 2.5 times. And this means defined as by the apparent size of a point source emitting light. So um, we cannot separate two structures which are uh, close to each other below the diffraction limit, but um, of course we can improve the resolution in all dimensions. Dr. DeBach, what would be the advantage of using cryoclem confocal based compared to WF Thunder? Very good question. <laughs> um, of course, a wide field system um, does not deliver the same axial, the same Z resolution as a confocal. And a confocal would improve even um, the axial resolution even more. And we can provide also a cryoconfocal um, system. And um, if you plan to, um, to, to purchase such a system, please get in contact with one of our local uh, Leica um, uh, colleagues, uh, because we handle these projects project by project. But we can provide it and the actual resolution is even more improved. Thank you. Is the 50 times objective the only option? What if we need a higher magnification? Um, yeah, the 50 times objective indeed is uh, the only option because it's our dedicated cryo objective. Um, and and it already has um, a numerical aperture of 0 0.9. And if you want to go higher, actually you need immersion. and of course, under cryo conditions, immersion is quite tricky. There are some um, systems out there which are not commercially available, uh, but um, yeah, it's kind of tricky to really work with immersion. So the 50 times objective is our um, objective of choice, and um, we also use that for the control system. Now, Dr. Bach, DeBach, this is a little lengthy question, but I'm um, going to read it, and if you need me to repeat it, I can. Now, here's a question about workflows. And sorry, this may be a naive question because I'm not an expert in tomography or these new techniques. But why is it necessary to do coding of a sample before FIB and cryotomo? Or that example is if you want to do SEM. I thought you could take the FIB lamella directly and put it in the cryo micro microscope to obtain the tomograms. Yeah, so um, the question is quite good. Um, um, the milling process um, so uh, is quite harsh to the sample, or could be harsh, because you direct focused ion beams. So you direct um, ion, ion beams on the sample in a focused way, and you really remove material. And if you would not protect actually the surface and therefore the, the, the edge of the, the lamella created, you would actually remove also a part of the actual lamella you want to achieve. And by this, um, to avoid this, you have to protect it by this platinum layer um, yeah, that you get a nice sheet uh, which is not destroyed. Yeah. Thank you. Now, Dr. DeBach, do you have any examples of bacterial samples, such as individual bacteria, microcolonies, biofilms? Yeah, thank you for this question. Um, we already um, had several um, machine demonstrations with bacteria, and you can nicely resolve single bacteria, um, even the distribution um, um, of the fluorescence along the uh, uh, bacterial axis, for example. That was nicely um, uh, visualizable, one can say, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, Dr. DeBach, thank you for your talk. Do I understand correctly that the Thunder is only a digital technique applied after acquisition? So the imaging itself is still standard wide field. That's exactly the case. So um, on this system, we, we um, do a post-processing Thunder. So you don't need to necessarily um, do the Thunder processing afterwards. Um, but of course, it's it's very fast because it's our like a proprietary technique, and we actually developed um, this technique also for live samples that the the thunder process is is applied directly kind of in real life. Yeah. 
exactly. So it, it's really um, a fast technique. Excellent. Thank you. Now, we do have time for a few more questions, but I do want to let our audience know that any questions we are unable to answer live today, and additionally, those questions that are submitted during the on-demand period, they will be addressed by our speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. So let's get squeeze in some more questions here. Dr. DeBach, what is the difference between thunder clearing and deconvolution? So um, we refer to thunder actually as, um, as both techniques. The first part is the computational clearing, so removing the background, uh, which is inherent to uh, white field images. And a second part is um, what, I, what I showed to you, the small volume computational clearing and large volume computational clearing. Probably I can show you um, the images, the related images. So the core technology is the instant computational clearing, removing the background and keeping the true spatial dimensions. And then in a second step, actually, we do this decision mask technology deconvolution. So we really run what we say a, um, a structural element over this, uh, the sample and we look where is background, where is signal, and um, uh, um, yeah, we kind of do a fully automatic deconvolution. So actually, a manual input is not really necessary, but of course, you can uh, tweak um, the, the, the settings a little bit according to your um, specimen. Thank you. Now I have a two-part question for you. Can multiple targets be identified on a single grid? And what is the time needed to mill a lamella? The first question I can refer to, so you can um, define as many targets as you want. Um, of course, you can also have different uh, uh, lamella targets on one grid. Um, actually, the next generation, for example, the Aquilos can do an automatic milling and you can have, I don't know, 10, 20 uh, lamella milled automatically on one grid, depending on the sample position uh, uh, inside of grid squares. And um, the milling time, I'm a light microscopy expert, but I, if I look over the shoulder of somebody who is milling, it, um, it, needs, uh, it can need half an hour or sometimes longer, depending on how thick the sample is. But um, it's in the range of, yeah, probably less than half an hour um, yeah, in that range. Um, Thank you. And I wanted and to answer. Part of that? Sorry, can you repeat the second part? <laughs> I can. Yes, that's. I was just going to ask you. What is the time needed to mill a lamella? Ah, yeah, okay. I referred to that already. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Very good. All right. Our next question: Is it possible to use the microscope at room temperature, or is it only usable at cryo temps? You can just use the system uh, also under room temperature conditions, no problem, as long as um, you use grids. So you can uh, load, probably can show this in the correct uh, slide here. As you can see on the slide, you um, load these little cartridges with a, uh, with a, with a grids loaded and um, we cannot really apply normal slides or so. For this, you would have to remove the cryo stage here of the, uh, on top of the motorized stage and uh, yeah, have, a, have a sample loader here. But normally, we would just use grids on the system. And Dr. DeBach, what are the, yes, what are the prospects of integration with the dual cryo arm system? Um, so I, I probably answered this question already. Um, the coordinate file and the image um, file are in a standard format. This means the images are exported in TIFF format or OME TIFF. OME stands for Open Microscopy Environment TIFF. So you can select actually the, 
the format you want to have. Um, it can also be exported as bitmap or JPEG, but I think these are not uh, very common in this uh, sense. And um, the coordinates, so the marker coordinates, can be exported as XML standard file. And as long as the EMM, EM manufacturer can read these XML files, they can also load the coordinates. Of course, together with the integrated workflow here, together with Thermo Fisher, we actually load um, one file where the images and the coordinates are already in, and it's just one click and everything is loaded, the correct histograms, the correct lookup tables, uh, the coordinates, and it directly snaps to the a sample holder scheme in Thermo Fisher Maps. So this is kind of the first steps already of a fine uh, correlation and just by one click. Thank you. Our next question is two parts. What samples beyond cell culture and yeast has this workflow been validated for? And could it be used for plant tissue samples, for example, a small portion of a leaf? Very good question. Uh, again, thank you for all these questions. They are really relevant and also um, uh, uh, help to, to really give you a better picture of the system. Um, as said, we already had um, samples like yeast, uh, any single cell uh, which you can imag imagine, whether they are um, grown on EM grid or um, deposited. Uh, we already had um, bacteria, and you can also have bigger samples as long as you can nicely vitrify them. And the first technique for that would be high pressure freezing of grids, but also, of course, grid plunging. And as long as you can um, vitrify them properly, um, we can look at them. And together with the sample technology, we can also examine thicker samples, like only uh, two cells or so, uh, two cell layers. So we can also use thicker samples. Thank you. And I did see a question come in multiple times. It's, is this webinar being recorded and it can, can it be reviewed again, can be viewed a second time? And yes, it is being recorded and we will send you an email shortly when this is available for replay. And you can share that link with all your colleagues and friends who may have missed today's event. And let's wrap with this final question, Dr. DeBach. How long could we keep the vitrified grid on the stage of the optical microscope? Actually, um, what the Max Planck Institute did, they just checked um, how long can they keep the sample on the, on the, on the stage during imaging and um, without imaging before seeing uh, spectral contaminations. And um, they found out that uh, after seven hours, so this is really a long, long period, they, they saw um, uh, contaminations. So this means you can do imaging and you can keep the sample um, for several hours without any compromise here on the system. Dr. DeBach, thank you so much for this excellent Q&A. Do you have any final comments you'd like to leave our audience with? So thank you all for joining and for this, um, this really very well asked questions. Um, all the questions which appear here will be answered and um, uh, we get in touch with you. And if you want to see the machine in action, please contact your local uh, Leica colleague or just write us an email, uh, no problem. Uh, we will get in touch with you and really thank you very much for joining this webinar. It was a great pleasure for me. And um, please stay healthy in these times and I hope that we can uh, see in person, see each other in person, um, at least some of you. I saw some familiar names here on the list as well. Thank you. Thank you also to you, and Christy. Thank oh, and thank you, Dr. DeBach. And before we go, I do want to thank our audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. We had so many questions that we were unable to address today live. So as Dr. DeBach did mention, we will be addressing them via your email address that you provided at the time of registration. Also, please continue to submit those questions during the on-demand event. 
just come on back. It's available for unlimited on-demand viewing, and you can continue to submit those questions, and they will be answered via email. I'd also like to thank Dr. Jan de Bach for his time today. Thank you so much for joining us. And for your important research, we'd also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Leica Microsystems, for underwriting today's educational webcast. As I mentioned, this webcast can be viewed on demand, and we'll send you an email shortly letting you know when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. We thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Stay healthy and have a great day.